do what we can to save these little young ones so they can continue with this gospel. We are in those end times and we can feel it, we can see it every day, but we need these young people to move that gospel for us. And the only way they can move it is for us as adults to make sure we're encouraging them and pushing them to the word of God. So Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So with that, I'm going to start inviting our young people. Um, and the first person who's going to lead us is uh, Darius. And I know the parents are sitting there um, with Pastor Pule. We know it's very difficult. Take it from me, it's very hard standing up here and talking to everybody. So I know, Darius, you will do us all proud as you start us off. Um, and everybody else will follow just behind one kid after the other. So as I ask to please continue praying for them as they're speaking. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm Doris, and this morning I want to start by sharing a bit about who I am. I'm currently 13 years old and a student at Suncoast Christian College. Here are the people who are closest to me. My parents, my sister Bronte, and my two elder siblings, Faith and Melendo. I have a keen interest in sports, specifically basketball and volleyball, which I enjoy playing with my schoolmates. In my Pathfinder club, my favorite recollection is of those moments spent around the campfire, munching on marshmallows and stargazing during our camping adventures. Today, I've prepared a short sermonette focusing on Samson and his spiritual and physical struggle with God. My talk will revolve about around three main points. One, an outline of Samson's character. Two, a recounting of his story. And three, my personal takeaways from Samson's life. Samson's birth and Nazarite vow. Born to Manoah and his once barren wife after a divine visitation, Samson was in Nazareth. Nazarite from birth, indicating a lifelong commitment to serve God. This meant he was abstained from alcohol, refrained from touching corpses, and never cut his hair. Samson also was blessed with supernatural strength. He used this power to vanquish his foes. One instance was when he overpowered a Philistine army single-handedly, using only a donkey's jawbone. Oh, donkey's jawbone. Weakness for women. Despite his parents' objections, Samson wedded a Philistine woman. This led to conflicts due to a riddle he crafted, which was ultimately solved through his wife's treachery. Story overview. Well, where did Samson falter and what were the consequences? Samson's major weakness was his vulnerability to the allure of women, especially a woman named Delilah. Deceivingly, Delilah was persuaded by the Philistine laws to uncover the secret of Samson's strength. One night, she persuaded Samson into revealing his power of source. He told her he would lose all his strength if his hair was shaved off. Eventually, Delilah cut Samson's hair, leading to his capture and imprisonment by the Philistines. However, in his last moments, he prayed to God to restore his strength. Using his restored strength, he brought down the pillars of the temple, ending his life along with numerous Philistines. Samson's downfall was his in, uh, inability to uphold his Nazarite vow, but in his final act shows his return to God using his divine strength one last time to vanquish the Philistine. My personal takeaways. My reflections from Samson's story have highlighted the, highlighted the importance of emotional and spiritual health. Firstly, self-control. Despite his incredible strength, incredible strength. Samson's downfall lay in his lack of self-control, particularly in his love life. This teaches us the importance of regulating our emotions and actions and respecting personal boundaries. Secondly, consequences of actions. Samson's story underscores the critical notion that ac actions have repercussions. His heedless actions led to his downfall, a powerful reminder of the potential gravity of our decisions. Finally, faith and repentance. Despite his numerous faults, Samson's story ends on a note of redemption. 
demonstrating that it's never too late to seek forgiveness and ratif ratification. There was a time in my life when I almost missed the opportunity to be a blessing because of my selfish desire. On my journey to New Zealand, we embarked on a shopping spree. Amidst our stroll, our paths crossed with the homeless individual, Blink blinded by the excitement to acquire a new toy that had caught my fancy for a while. I overlooked him. As we neared the store, however, guilt troubled my conscience, and the dilemma of the homeless man struck me, and I decided to contribute my money that was gifted to me from my family towards his cause. Determined, I retraced my steps alone and handed him the money. His gratitude was immense, for he had been in dire need for the funds. In remembrance, I was profoundly happy that I was able to use the money I received to be a blessing in his life. Thank you for listening. Happy Sabbath, Church. My name is Christian, and let me talk about more of my interests so you can get to know me better. My favorite sports are rugby, volleyball, and soccer as well. At home, I spend most of my time playing anything from video games to board games and card games, just to pass the time. As well, I find it exciting to challenge myself and refine my skills, or to learn new skills. At Pathfinders, one of my most memorable experiences was the bushwalk we had at Mount Me. It was an incredible experience. It was a wonderful opportunity to connect with friends and race down the mountain. But today I will be presenting the golden calf and my personal experience when I turned away from God. Today, let us reflect upon the story of Aaron's struggle with temptation and the consequences that followed. In the book of Exodus, we learn about the time when the Israelites turned away from God and decided to worship a golden calf. Aaron's story teaches us about the dangers of falling into our desires and turning away from the path of righteousness. Initially, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, the Israelites grew impatient and began to question their faith. Feeling uncertain and vulnerable, they turned to Aaron, expecting him to provide guidance and support. Unfortunately, instead of leading them back to God, Aaron gave back into the gift. Aaron gave into their demands and crafted a golden calf for worship. In Exodus 32, verse Aaron answered them, Take off the earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. We can only imagine the pressure Aaron faced during this time. Perhaps he was influenced by fear, uncertainty, or the pressure placed by the people. Nevertheless, his actions did not align with his leadership responsibilities or his, the commitment to God. It greatly displeased God who envisioned Aaron as a strong, steadfast leader. In Exodus 32, 9-10, God said, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. The Israelites made God, made God so angry that he sought out revenge on the very people he saved from Egypt. Additionally, it led to a division and loss of trust within the Israelite community. In our own lives, it is crucial to consider the consequences of our actions before making decisions. We should strive to make choices that reflect our values and honor our commitment to ourselves, others, and our faith. And it is important to note that he later repented and sought forgiveness from God. This demonstrates the power of redemption and, and we all must learn from our mistakes and grow in our faith. Now it is time for me to tell my story about how I turned from God. And I realized how easy it is to get lost in the pursuit of joy and forget about the important things in life. Just like Aaron, I had lost my way and become addicted to playing on my Switch. It started as a healthy reward after school, but soon enough, I found myself playing on it all the time, neglecting my responsibilities. It was only when my Switch broke that I realized how much of my life I had been wasting on something so meaningless. I realized there's something much more important to, there's more things much more important to life than just playing video games all day. There are countless opportunities to learn new things, meet new people, and experience new things. It's easy to get caught up in the pursuit of pleasure, but it's also important to remember that our relationship with God, our family, and our community should always come first. These are the things that truly matter in life and bring us lasting happiness. So let's make a conscious effort to prioritize the important things in life and live each day with purpose and meaning. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Peyton.
I'm in year seven at North Pine Christian College and I live at Ocean. I live at Ocean View. Here is a picture of my family. My dad, Justin, mum, Elsa, and two brothers, Sonny and Blake. One of my favorite memories of Pathfinders so far is the big walk we did down to the river at the Smith Farm. On the way back, we went through a river and had to walk up the ridge through long grass. Today, I'll be talking about Daniel and how he was able to hold on to Jesus even when his circumstances were hard. And when I say hard, I mean circumstances that were extremely difficult and sometimes terrifying. When I took a closer look at the book of Daniel, I quickly realized his life was full of trials, but he chose to hold on to God time after time. When Daniel was just a teenager, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and captured him. He took Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because he wanted young, intelligent, and handsome men to work for him at the palace. This was Daniel's first big trial that we know of. He was taken from his family and his home. He was made to learn a new language, culture, gods, and he was even given a new name, which was Belshazzar. Most of us are familiar with the story. Daniel refused the king's food and drink because he wanted to continue to serve the true God of Israel in a foreign place. Daniel still held on to God in time, and he and his friends became ten times better in wisdom and understanding than all magicians than all the magicians in the whole kingdom. In chapter 2, we read that King Nebuchadnezzar had a disturbing dream. No one could tell him what this dream was and the meaning, so he became furious and ordered the execution of all the wise men in Israel. Instead of being crippled with fear, Daniel requested some time so he could spend the night in prayer with his friends. That night, God revealed the dream to him and the men's lives were saved. In Daniel chapter 2, Verse 47, we see the king coming to Daniel and saying, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Daniel brought glory to God by holding on to him, and God continued to use Daniel as his messenger in Babylon. Years later, a few men found out that the current king of Babylon, King Darius, was going to put Daniel in charge of the whole kingdom because he was so trustworthy. These men watched Daniel for weeks, hoping he would make a mistake that they could tell the king about, but they couldn't find anything that he was doing wrong in the eyes of the king. Wanting to trick him, the men went to King Darius and convinced him to make a new law. Although King Darius knew Daniel, he wasn't thinking about him at the time, and so he went ahead and made the law so no one could worship anyone else except himself. Even though Daniel knew of the law, he still prayed three times per day in front of his open window, as he had always done. Again, he very openly held on to God, even in terrifying circumstances. The men came and took Daniel away, and he was thrown into the lion's den. God's protection was covering Daniel, and he wasn't harmed. What I've learned from the story is that our unwavering faithfulness to God will not go unnoticed by others or by God or others. It can be really hard sometimes to hold on to him when everyone is watching, but God rewards his loyal followers. We can't deny God in public and then expect him to protect us. We also can't deny God in public and still expect that people learn of our God. We must have faith and be proud of our love for Jesus. A time I've openly shown my love for Jesus was at year seven school camp. I prayed openly before bed in my cabin, even though others were there. This reminds me of Daniel continuing his regular prayers even when he knew others were watching. Let us be encouraged to hold on to Jesus and be open in public about our love for him just as Daniel was throughout his life. Thank you. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Hi, my name is Amok Quirt and I am 10 years old and I am in year 5 at North Pike Christian College. I come from a Christian family with my mum, Leisha, my dad, Kassa, and my two younger brothers named Malachi and Micah, who are now 6 years old. My favourite moment of Pathfinders so far is when we did the Fire Olympics at our last camp. We were judged by our fire structure, how well we lit the fire using the least amount of matches, and how well we cooked our dinner. We cooked damper, my favourite, 
French toast and baked apple with sultanas, which was very delicious. This is a picture of us preparing our dinner. Today, I am talking about one person in the Bible who had the opportunity to back away from Jesus, but instead stayed near. Her name is Ruth. Now, you might already know the story of Ruth, but I am going to talk about how Ruth stayed close to God and how we can apply that into our very own life. Ruth was a Moabite. She grew up in a culture that didn't believe in the one true God and worshipped many other gods. Moab is what we now call Jordan. At the beginning of the book, we find out that Ruth's husband died and so did her brother-in-law. Just imagine your spouse and your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law passing away. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, had already lost her husband, Elimelech, in the time of the judges. So all the fam ladies in the family were now widows. In the Bible times, if your husband died, you must go back to your homeland to be supported. Naomi's hometown was Judah. When Naomi, Ruth and Oprah had just begun their journey back to Judah, Naomi told her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab. That way, they could return to their parents' home and find new husbands for themselves. They would also return to their old gods. Oprah nodded and went back to Moab, but in Ruth 1 verse 16, we read Ruth telling her mother-in-law, Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Could it be that the reason Ruth was a loyal daughter-in-law and chose to worship the Israelite God was because of the influence of her husband and mother-in-law? This was a Moabite deciding to abandon a promising future in Moab and follow an Israelite woman to the unknown. This is where we see Ruth holding on to God. When they arrived, word went around that there were two widows living in Bethlehem. When Naomi and Ruth found a place to stay, Naomi asked Ruth to go to the nearest wheat field and collect wheat buds to bake bread. Ruth obeyed. She went into a wheat field that belonged to a rich man met named Boaz. Boaz was a faithful and kind man and would become a biblical example of Christ himself, the Redeemer. So because of Boaz's kind heart, he asked his servant who was the lady in the wheat field. The servant replied with saying, it's a foreigner. Boaz said to leave some wheat buds for her. The next day, when Ruth went to collect some wheat buds, she got lots of them. When she told Naomi this, Naomi smiled and told Ruth to go have dinner with Boaz. When Ruth got back from her dinner with Boaz, she fell in love with him, and then they got married. Then they had a son named Obed, who was the father of Jesse. He was the father of David, who was the father of Solomon and so on, until Jesus Christ came into this world. A great nation came from Ruth, all because she decided to hold on to God. Ruth could have gone back to Moab with Oprah, but instead went with Naomi. I learned that if you have faith in the one true God, that he will set your path straight. A very specific time that I held on to God was the time that two girls were bullying me day after day after day. And I couldn't take it anymore. For those who have been bullied, you will know how hard it can be. When I told my teacher this, my teacher thought I was lying, since the two girls were always such good students, and one of the girls' dad was the principal of the school. I knew I could pray to God, because that's what my parents taught me to do. I prayed, and by the end of the year, one, one girl had left the school, and then the other left last year in 2022. I know God won't always take my problems away, like he did this time, but ever since then, I've known that Jesus Christ, my saviour, will set me free. I know God has a plan for all of you. The only step to take is a leap of faith, like Ruth did, when she could have left Naomi and gone back to her hometown, where she may have had a better future, but instead, she stayed close to the one true God. 
Some of us already took a step, a leap of faith, by coming to church today. By coming to church today, you have all decided to hold on to Jesus. You could have sat, on, sat at home on your phone, going for coffee or socialising. If you dedicate your life to Jesus and decide to always try to hold on to him, he promises to never, never leave us or forsake us, like he didn't forsake Ruth. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm Bronte Puller and just 11 years old. Currently, I'm in sixth grade at Suncoast Christian College. I find great pleasure in playing basketball and spending quality time with my friends. In my family, I'm the youngest with three siblings preceding me. My favorite memory in Pathfinders was learning how to do the slip knot with Auntie Kirsten's dad. The anecdote I'm about to share today is a historical event that is found in the book of Joshua 2, verse 1 to 24. One of the main characters in the story is Rahab. She is also mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, verse 5. Additionally, she is referred in Hebrews 11, verse 31 and James 2, verse 25 as an example of a person of faith. Let's journey back to Jericho in the time of Rahab, so I ask you to sit back and relax. Rahab was a prostitute who sold herself because she knew that was the only way to survive. Rahab was extremely poor and lived in the city wall of a fortified city that God was going to deliver into the hands of the Israelites. Little did she know that she would have a very significant part to play in God's plan of deliverance. Following Moses' death, God's chosen leader Joshua deployed two top-notch spies from Shittim to scout out Jericho, who names it in the Bible, but Jewish literature identifies them as Pinchas and Caleb. They were discreet, gathering details about the enemy's military strength and weapons. Their exit, however, was noticed by a vigilant soldier who alerted the others. The frantic soldier pursued the fleeing spies, who ultimately took refuge at Rahab's house. Surprised, Rahab let the spies in and hid them on her rooftop. When the soldiers came knocking, she missled them about the spies' whereabouts. The spies expressed their gratitude to Rahab, who requested kindness for herself and her family. When their God grants them victory of the land, they agreed leaving her a rope as a sign of her safety. Eventually, the Israelites demolished Jericho's walls after circling the city seven times. Amidst the city-wide havoc, Rahab's household remained untouched. Rahab's story illustrates the power of faith and redemption, despite her profession as a prostitute. Her recognition of God's power and her faith led her to play a significant role in God's plan. Her story underscores that everyone holds value regardless of their past. Interestingly, her faith and actions ensure her inclusion in Jesus' lineage, a testament to God's inclusive love and mercy, her trust in God's protection and mercy is evident in spies promising to spare her and her family. My takeaways and lessons were, number one, stand up for you, what you believe. Just as Rahab understood that the God of Israel was real and powerful, nothing was going to stand in the way of God's plan. Number two, treat everyone with respect and kindness, just as Rahab hid the two spies in her own home, regardless of who they were. And number three, Faith can lead to significant rewards, just as Rahab and her family were spared because of Rahab's faith and courage. I want to recount a personal experience in which I had to make a crucial choice. There was this one time at school when my friend was acting quite disrespectful towards a boy, labeling him with an offensive name. <laughs> the words were clearly causing him pain, and initially I just stood by, taking in the situation silently. However, it soon struck me that my silent presence was in essence a form of participation in the unfair act. I tried to imagine myself in the boy's place to better understand his feelings. I knew I had to defend him despite the challenge it posed given my close friendship with the girl. Ultimately, I gathered the courage to tell her, don't say that, and we then left the boy alone. Reflecting on this incident, I now comprehend that I chose to stand with God rather than taking the simpler path of mere observation. 
My past actions may not reflect a consistent effort to confront my friends when they're being unkind to others, but Rahab's story provides me with an inspiration. A reminder that our past does not dictate our present or future. I am empowered to choose to follow Jesus moving forward. Thank you for listening. Happy Sabbath, church. My name is Danielle. I am 12 years old, and I come from a family of four. My mom, Vimbai, my dad, Tamwana, and my little brother, Gabriel. My favorite Pathfinder memory is cooking with Matt activity, where we learned for the first time how to cook with our gas stoves. My theme today is holding on to Jesus. The person that I am going to focus on is a Shumanite woman. A woman from Shuman had an old husband and no children. Elijah came to visit frequently for meals. One day, the Shumanite woman told her husband that they should build a small upper room for Elisha in their house. So they started working on getting the mud, letting it sit in the sun, and then piling the bricks one after the other. Eventually, when the room was done, Elisha came for another visit and lay down in the room. Elisha then told his servant to go call the Shumanite woman. When she was called, Elisha told his servant to say to the Shumanite woman that she has been concerned for them with all the care and to ask what Elisha can do for her. May you please open your Bibles to 2 Kings 4 verse 14 to 17 where we continue with the story. And it says, what can be done for her, Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Please, men of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. Right now, in the Shumanite woman's life, things are taking a great turn. But where is the part where she has to hold on to Jesus? We will soon find out. So after the Shumanite woman had a son, he grew up and went with his fathers to the reapers. And he told his father that his head was sore. So the father told a servant to go and carry the boy to his mother. When the servant had taken the boy to his mother, the boy sat on his mother's knees to noon, then died. When the Shumanite woman went up and laid her son on Elisha's bed and shut the door upon him, then she called to her husband so that she may run to Elisha and come back. But he asked why she was going to, El to Elisha as neither new moon nor the Sabbath. And she replied, it is well. She then took her donkey and departed to see Elisha. Soon Elisha saw her far off and told his servant Gehazi to go and run out to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? So Gehazi went off and the Shumanite reply, woman replied, it is well. Now when she came to Elisha on the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. Though Elisha did not approve of it and told Gehazi to leave her alone, since her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hidden it from him. The Shumanite woman then said, Did I ask of a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Don't deceive me? Elisha then said to Gehazi to take his staff into his hand and be on his way. If Gehazi meets anyone on the road, he must not greet them. And if anyone greets him, then he must not answer them but lay Elisha's staff on the face of the child. After Gehazi did this, he went back to meet Elisha and the Shumanite woman as they had started walking, and Gehazi told Elisha that the child was not awakened. When Elisha came to the house, the child was in his, was in his room, lying dead on his bed. 
Elisha went into his room and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. The Shumanite woman was staying strong and courageous as she held on to Jesus. We continue the story if we open our Bibles to 2 Kings 4, verse 34 to 35. And it says, Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, but got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Once the child was awake, Elisha called Zakazi and told him to call the woman. So Zakazi did as he was told, and the woman came in, and Elisha t- told her to pick up her child. So the Shumanite woman went in and fell at Elisha's feet and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Everyone in their life has challenges. As Christians, we face persecution and hardship as we follow the teachings of God. This story is one of many that talks about holding on to Jesus. The Shumanite woman did not give up, even though her son was da- had died. She did not bury him and leave him. Instead, she went to go and find the man of God, Elisha. Having so much faith in God makes her an admiring woman. The one thing that I have learned from this story is that we as Christians cannot drop the ball and run away from God when terrible things happen to us. We need to hold on and stay fast, as when everything is over and we're in heaven, will be worthwhile. When I think of the question, when was there a time when I held on to Jesus? I start to think of all the significant times in my life. But then I think about the small little things, like school. The school that I go to is not an Adventist school, and some of the activities are on Saturdays. Each time I shrug it off, but on Monday when I come back to school, everyone's talking about it like it was the best time of their life, and I feel left out. Though the one thing that keeps me not going to those activities on Saturday is my parents, of course, but also that I love coming to church because I do not see everyone in this church every day, and it's always a joy to come to church and rest. I enjoy my time here doing Pathfinders and going to Sabbath school. I grew up in this church. The listing are all these things, I've realized the one most important reason why I come to church is obedience to God by holding on to Jesus. Just as a Shumanite woman did, because as he says in the Bible, the seventh day is a day of rest. Thank you. Can we say another amen for our young people? And I'm sure you were all blessed with some powerful and personal stories, right? Um, I loved how our kids were very vulnerable today. They shared their true experiences they've all felt and they've all encountered. And we realize they are going through difficult moments, but they're learning to trust in God. Just like I'm hoping how they share that, we can also learn the same thing as adults, that we should also be trusting in God as we go through our lives. So with that, at this moment, we will stand up for our closing hymn, uh, hymn 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Oh, 
Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being our friend, oh dear Lord. Thank you for reminding us that whatever burden, whatever pain, and whatever joy we're also going through, we can always take it to you in prayer. Always trusting in you um, and help us to continue to stay on our knees, to pray to you, God, and trust you that you will lead us every step of the way as we go through life. And a big thank you to you for just... Uh, guiding your young people this morning for blessing us with your word and helping them to share their personal experiences. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.